sitting here interviewing Dave J uh, has quite a colorful career involved in the equestrian industry um, along multiple facets. Dave, I, I brought a picture to show you. Why don't you take a look at it and give me your impression? It's a fun picture. Well, his name is Will Rogers. Well, my father aspired to be like him. My father was an Oki and he loved the cowboy stuff. That's a one of a kind uh, painting, not a photo, painting great of Will Rogers. So, boy, my dad would love that. Except for he passed away. <laughs> <laughs> He's with us now. He's Little enjoying things. it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Will Rogers. So, reminding my audience, I'm here with Dave J, a colorful local Ocala person. What brings you to Ocala in general? <laughs> I, I found, you know, the Lipizzan show was out of Orlando. And I was working in Shreveport at a ranch for Bill Robinson. He owned DHL. And he sold half of the company for $500 million and bought Lusitanos. And I was training Lusitanos for the man. And then the Lipizzan show called me and said, we need you again. You know, and once you've heard the band play and people applaud, you go. <laughs> it's that simple. That applause will do anything. So how long have you lived here in the Ocala area and what changes have you seen since you've been here? 14 years. This equestrian center is one. Uh, outside of that, it was an old thoroughbred world here that stayed the same for years and years, you know. We didn't have much traffic here. We didn't have much, you know, it's just fun stuff. Uh, I came here working uh, carriage horses for a friend just for fun. No money, but fun. And then all of a sudden, everybody wanted carriage lessons. You're obviously passionate about the horse, like uh, myself and like most of the people that will be listening to this program. Why are you fascinated? What fascinates you about the horse? There's something eth ethereal, and they're in space. And it put me in a different mindset in space. Dave, I understand that you had a unique role being in the lead scene of the movie Hair, uh, riding a horse. Please tell me about that experience and how that developed and what it meant to you. How it developed was a friend of mine couldn't get another guy and he asked me to come and ride his second horse. He needed two in the movie. And I said, what movie? He said, it's called Hair. And I said, Hair? You know, isn't that a nudie thing and all that? No, it's not. And so I came to... I went from California to New York with him. Had a truck and trailer stolen in Oklahoma City. Had to hire a van to take us on to New York. It's, then we were stabled in the city in New York on East 82nd or something there. And then we had to get a special dispensation from the mayor of New York to wear actual police uniforms with badges and so and then then we filmed in the park now Twyla Thorpe who was the dance choreographer had sent Albert Osamar my friend the script and what we were supposed to do it didn't work that way but that's what we were supposed to do and you know, they, they filmed us coming through a tunnel with a fire a barrel burning fire, and we were inside the fire coming this way. And then we, you know, it was to set up a scene that was so futuristic, and New York was like this special place, and the kid that was the lead was supposed to be from Oklahoma. And uh, Milos Borman, he loved horses. So uh, the whole thing started, you know, we did a week's filming for about 40 seconds worth of film. But what we would do is uh, Albert and I both told her 
She said, well, I want you out here at least eight hours a day rehearsing this. Said, uh, that's not the way it works in Hollywood. The SPCA will be down on us. This is all we can do. We'll do X scene here. You film it. You take it into the, uh, the takes and look at the takes, and then we'll decide if what we want to do tomorrow. So I'm not having you then. Milos Foreman said, then I'm not having you to her. He said, never mind, I love the horses. He, they do what they want. So that's how hair went. Then I, I went to the theater and, you know, you see yourself 40 foot square there and you go, oh my God, <laughs> what is that me? And, is that, and then then it's done and you say is that all they were going to do that's all dave as a kid i understand you grew up riding and working with horses however along the way besides your family experience doing it you ran into and worked with a legendary hollywood horse trainer named glenn randell tell me a little bit about that experience how that happened and why was he such a great trainer and what did he teach you why he was such a great trainer he told me it had paid <laughs> a lot of money. And he did all the triggers and the red pony and the black stallion. And we did the black stallion in the year I had went back to him to learn something. And uh, he just had a different mind. He was a horse in a human body. What makes a great horse trainer is a certain kind of arrogance and, and personality, but you got to be quiet, you know, and you got to, he used to grab me all the time and jerk me out of the way, so don't get hurt, be quiet, get out of the way, but do it softly. He, uh, he grew up in his life grading rows for him. 20 mules and all that kind of thing, road graders. And then he read some books and he saw some movies and he wanted to go to Hollywood and he did. And uh, he didn't want to be a stuntman, you could get hurt, so he became a horse trainer. He, what he couldn't learn, you can't teach. And what he can't teach you, you can't learn. So he, in just, and he was, it was so attracted to be around this guy and to help him train. And, you know, I did a lot of work with it. And it was all fun and it was good work. Because, you know, he, he yelled at you all the time. But, he, you know, it was a different kind of yelling. It was, and he had a guy during the Ben-Hur picture, he did Ben-Hur. And the Spanish riding school came down and got him and said, we want to show you what we do with these horses at the Spanish riding school. And he said, and he said, this tall gentleman with a nice mustache, and he said, I'm Podaisky from the Spanish riding school. Glenn said, I'm Randall from Hollywood. <laughs> and he said, that conversation went on just like that for 15 minutes. And he said, finally, he said, what are you doing with these horses? And he said, well, I'll show you. He said, I've heard, heard about your work. And Glenn said, he had the, the chariots and all that. Were, those were Lipizzaners that they got from uh, Hungary or somewhere there. And Glenn said, well, you know, I had them all standing up. I said, get up. And then they gave me an octagon tent, and I had them in every corner in their harness. And I'd just say, get up and come here. And they would all walk to me. He said, but those lippets on her say hop to me. He said, I said, that's cute as hell, isn't it? They're hopping. And Podaisky said, those are called Corvettes. <laughs> and Clint said, maybe I should come to the school and see what you do. So he did, and they sent him back Adolf Delbos, who was a, one of the head writers. 
back to California to learn from Glenn, but 32 years later, Adolf was still with Glenn. I got there, and Glenn and Adolf, and these two little old fat men. Here, you touch them here, you touch them there, you do this, you do that. You can't buy that kind of training, you know. Just can't be had. So I loved to be there with those two old men. And one of them was classical as a god. That's Adolf. And Glenn was, well, we just got to get that son of a bitch over there and that one over there and stand that horse up over there. And we got to do the black stallion picture. And I want you to poke him and piss him off. He chases you. That's what we want in the scene. Yeah, I know that somehow connected between you and Glenn Randall uh, was the name Yule Brenner and the Sheik, Clint Eastwood and Rawhide, Black Beauty and Trigger. How did these horses all, or how did you cross paths with this trainer and with these horses or with those stories? I was on the Lipizzan show, and the manager came to me and said, you know, if you would you got the personality and the looks and you got all those things you need to put us an act together i said i do and so i was reading a magazine western horseman and some writer was talking about glenn randall so uh i said i'll i'll call him on the phone randall and see if he's got any horses that i could use as an act on this show you know, unique looking, different, something else. And uh, I called him up and I said, this guy John Dean told me to call you. I didn't know him from Adam. You, know. I didn't know John Dean. And Glenn didn't know who John Dean is either because he had done a million articles and it was just another article. And he goes, well, yeah, whoever you said. Come on out, and I'll show you some horses. And that's what happened. I went out, and we had Evelyn Finley, who had been the double for Mary Pickford. She'd been with Glenn for 30 years, and she had a little black horse, just ugly as mud. But it did every high school movement there was. Fabulous. She said, I trained this one. Take a look at it, but I'm 6'3", and this horse was 14 hands. I said, no, I don't want that one. Then they showed me a couple more, and then Sheik, and I said, I'll buy that one. I just like it. What do you want? And it was so cheap in those days, you know. It, I think he told me $10,000. And I said, oh, I'll take it right now. And then I... Then I went back to the show, decided how much I wanted a week to work it on the show. And then uh, on our show was another guy, this Albert Ossemeyer, may have been the greatest high school trainer, the circus trainer in the world. And he and I were kind of competing for top spot. Whoever got the applause on that show got paid more than anyone else. It was all applause, and I knew how to get applause. You know, if you did this, and this, and this while riding a horse, you got applause, going sideways to the audience. So, uh, Albert, he was one of those guys, he said, you're a horse, and you're getting more applause than me, and you're outworking me. So I'm going to go home and train for six months. I'll come back and you won't have a horse as good as mine. I said, okay, you do that. And he went home and finished another horse that was terrific. But that's how that show went for years. Albert and I, Albert would work his horses at two in the morning in the arena. At two in the morning, I would be in the grandstand learning what he was doing. Every night at two o'clock, I went to the, to the arena and sat in the grandstand. There is Albert down there working his next high school horse or his old one with poor, with David Chase stealing it in my mind. 
you know, I hadn't had any experience whatsoever with high school or dancing horses. It wasn't part of my vernacular. But I joined that show anyway and was riding there and said, I need to make more money. So that's how I got into that. Most of the public recognizes Clint Eastwood. He's a very popular guy and supposedly stored in Rawhide. And before that, I understand he starred in a lot of TV shows and movies till he became famous. But did you cross with him or was that Glenn that crossed with him? And, and no, tell me... I, was, a, I went down and got it. I was... I ran into a friend of my dad's when he was a kid, uh, Slim Pickens. Slim Pickens told me to go to the Rawhide set, which was out in the sticks, and see if I couldn't get a job. And I did, and so I rode horses there for a little bit. And Eastwood was, was a rather attractive young man with something the rest of us don't have in life. I can't even tell you what it is. I, I, I ran into a lot of Hollywood people that couldn't tell what it was, but there was some kind of magnetism, something going on. Very attracted, but you didn't know what it was, but it was there. So I ran into Eastwood on that series. And he was a nice man. He was young then and just coming along you know, the, those kind of actors, they don't talk a lot on set. They're professionals. They sit down, eat lunch or whatever, then they go back, what are we doing now? And they, you know, and they just do the script and they do what they're told. It's very interesting how those people are. People think, well, maybe he's arrogant. Maybe he's a snob. No, he's just thinking about his job. And the job is always foremost, because that's what they were professionals at. You're just an idiot thinking, maybe I can do this, you know, but it doesn't happen. I, I thought Milos Foreman at uh, Harriset said, I'm going to use you on my next picture, son. I said, great, but he died. <laughs> <You know? laughs> my shot at Hollywood went away. In your storied, colorful career, is there one moment that stands out that's especially poignant? <laughs> one, yes, <laughs> that's poignant. The, the uh, general manager on the Lipizzan show was quitting and going home with his wife. And uh, he always paid me on Sunday. He hadn't paid me, but my wife had gotten the money. So consequently, I said, uh, hey, John, he was going, Dave, I'm leaving. I'll see you later. And he'd sort of been my friend there for 12 years. I was going, hey, John, how about the money? The money. He goes, Dave, I'm going to pay you what you've been after 12 years. I said, what's that? <laughs> that was poignant right there. <laughs> he said, oh, that's all you ever wanted here. You didn't ask for a lot of money. You just wanted the applause, and you got it. So, see it. <laughs> and he walked off and got in his rig and drove off the lot. And I was just standing there going. And Julianne, my wife, said, he paid us. And I said, oh, thank God. So you did a couple of commercial stints between the Lipizzaners, Medieval Times, Arabian Nights, things yeah. like this. What drew you to that? That's more of a commercial enterprise. And was there anything in particular that y y you thought is worth recounting to the general public? You know, without the general public, we didn't have anything. If they didn't come and you weren't good and there wasn't people coming and paying their fee, then you were nothing. That's what I thought of the public, and I loved the public. You know, number one, they paid my wages. Number two, they applauded. Number three, they wanted my autograph. Well, Times was an interesting place, you know, all that they choreographed every last move. And if a guy missed a move, he hit somebody, and then it was almost fist by time. And 
you know, when they were uh, lancing each other, you know, you learned which way to fall off, how many times to roll over once you hit the ground. It was all choreographed to the last ounce. So it was, for me, I hadn't done any of that. It was fun to learn, you know. I even learned to sword fight, lance, and everything. It's all part of, you know, it was part of the horse business. And my my uh, mindset was the Spanish riding school was the last great venture of super wealth. Do you know that? I I used to tell the story on that. They said that the, the, the Lippitz honor. The Lippitz honor was uh, the last great story. They put the best horses and riders together in one place, and it was the Habsburg Empire that put it together. And so the Habsburg had the greatest war horses, war generals, and if you saw 200 white horses with men in armor that was shinier than everything else with lances and shot fancy swords, you were afraid. You were intimidated. So that Habsburg thing is still going today, 600 years later. It was a very, and if one studies the story of the Lippus Otter, it's a very interesting story. And the last of its kind. You know, never again is that ever going to happen anywhere. Nobody's got the money to put together this fabulous thing. Nobody's got to put up a great writing hall with a picture of a king on the end. It's never going to happen again. It's too bad, but that's the way it is. How did you first get to Hollywood, and what were the first things that you were doing when you got to Hollywood within the equestrian skills? Kind of no skills, falling off horses, riding across a range, and just things like that. When I went down, it, uh, I hitchhiked. You know, people just don't do that kind of stuff anymore. But I had been riding in some rodeos, and I was hitchhiking to the next rodeo and decided to go to Hollywood. You know, what happened, I have no idea. You know how I got there, I have no idea. I just went there and said, Father said I could talk to Slim Pickens, and I thought I could, and I did. You know, that's the way things happen in life. You think you can, you want to, you do it. I used to do these things with the uh, 4-H kids after I came back and they said, well, how did you do all that? I said, I wanted to. And <laughs> that's the end of the story. You want to, you do. I have a dear friend who's a very successful businessman. and. I asked him at one time, I pitched him, and I said, and he, he never graduated high school, and I said, what made you such a high-end, successful businessman? He said, I've been in business my whole life. He said, some people are born lucky, and some aren't. He said, I really believe that. I said, well, it has to do with preparation, and I'm not. He says, eh. He Lost. said, some are born lucky, and some aren't, so I want your two cents on that. Yeah, I've had a lucky life like that. My father was lucky. And I, I buy uh, <laughs> scratchers from the lotto all the time. I win every time I buy one. It's good for something. It's just luck. We thank you so much for your time and your stories. And hopefully we pick up again with some more stories. And the future's yet to be written. But thanks again, thank Dave. You.